I ended the last segment talking about the incentive spirometer and how it provides feedback to the visual feedback to the patient so that the patient actually knows what is a good deep breath. Here's a sample question about incentive spirometers from NCLEX Quizzing. The nurse provides instructions to a client about the use of an incentive spirometer. The nurse determines that the client needs further teaching about its use if the client makes which statement. And watch out for these needs further teaching. So we're looking for the statement that's wrong. The patient says I need to sit up right when using the device. Well, yes, they do. It works a lot better if they sit up than if they're lying down. Next, I will inhale slowly, maintaining a constant flow. Yes, that's true. I need to place my lips completely over the mouthpiece. That is true. Also, after maximal inspiration, I will hold my breath for 10 seconds, then exhale. No, we don't need them to hold their breath quite that long. And two to three seconds is fine. So that's your wrong answer. That's why the client needs further teaching is because they are wrong. Chest physiotherapy is again usually done by a respiratory therapist but we need to know what it is we're going to talk about three different types here chest percussion vibration and postural drainage and these are all considered types of cpt or chest physiotherapy but they're all slightly different and we'll talk about the differences between them but before that we'll talk about some similarities the purpose of all of these chest physiotherapies are, is to um, mobilize secretions and because we're they work and they are going to mobilize secretions we have these bullet points down here so it should be done one hour before meals or two to three hours after meals and that's just because if we mobilize secretions they can drain into the stomach and, and make the patient sick at their stomach if they're receiving two feedings we put those on hold for the same reason and if they have a bronchodilator it's good if they will use that bronchodilator 15 minutes before because that's going to dilate the bronchioles so that when we mobilize the secretions they can cough them out easier so now we'll talk about the different types we'll start with um, chest percussion which is what is shown here with the physiotherapist using a cupped hand and they're going to basically strike the patient and it makes a slapping sound but with the hand cupped I promise you it sounds a lot worse than what it is it doesn't really hurt and if you don't believe me cup your hand and slap your thigh and you'll see that it really doesn't hurt a uh, similar practice is if you ever watch rodeo or um, any type of horsing event you'll see the rider looks like they're slapping their horse constantly on the neck but they're doing the same thing they're using a cupped hand it makes a loud popping noise and it kind of scares the horse but it doesn't really hurt and so that will be done by 20 to 30 seconds and a lot of times um, all three of these are done together but especially these first two are done together so they'll do percussion followed by vibration vibration is just what it sounds like it can be done manually and you just put your hands on the patient's chest and kind of um, do a real quick shaking but what I've seen I've never seen that done I've seen the vibration vest it's a special vest that you use and it electronically creates the vibration necessary to mobilize the secretion and finally we have postural drainage postural drainage again just like the name sounds it has the patient assume various positions and they maintain each position for about 15 minutes and it's going to promote um, draining of the lungs so that it can be expectorated so they hold each position a series of positions and then they may have to make sure that they don't sit up or go backwards because it kind of ruins their progress with any of these therapies we're going to stop them first of all if they hurt this isn't supposed to be a painful procedure. If their heart rate gets above 120 or they have hypotension or any signs of hypoxia, we, we stop the chest physiotherapy. It's not like a, a sport where you push yourself to the limits. This is supposed to be therapeutic and when it ceases to be therapeutic, we stop. So here's some questions, samples about um, chest physiotherapy the technique of positioning the patient to facilitate gravitational movement of respiratory secretions toward the bronchi and trachea for expectoration is called what well we know it's one of these three but when we're talking about positioning we're talking about the postural drainage if you're following along in your book I'm going back to chapter 30 to talk about suctioning page 535 and the first thing to know about suctioning is that 
it's not really good to do it if you don't have to. And so in your paragraph it says suction only when evidence indicates that it is necessary. And that evidence would be um, usually lung sounds. When we hear gurgling in the lungs, we know that suctioning needs to take place. Also, we might see some um, elevated respiratory rate, elevated heart rate, restlessness, but mainly it's the, the sound. We can just hear that gurgling sound that, and know that somebody needs to be suctioned. So there are certain steps that we follow when we're suctioning, and this doesn't matter whether we're going um, down the nose or through a trach, but whatever the case, we're going to first hyperoxygenate the patient. Sometimes it's just called oxygenating, but if they don't have oxygen on, we're going to have them take several deep breaths if they can. If they have oxygen, we turn it up higher than what it normally is. And we're going to repeat this at the end of the procedure as well. Then we're going to go down either through the nose or through the trach or whatever. And as you're going in with your suctioning catheter, you do not apply suction. And the way that we apply suction is we just cover the little valve with our thumb. And this is... Um, a sterile procedure, by the way, so it would be a, a well-gloved sterile thumb. Anyway, as we go in, we don't suction. Once you hit resistance, pull back just a few centimeters, and then you apply the suction intermittently as you rotate the catheter coming up, and you're going to limit your pass to about 10 seconds. Most nurses, when they do this, um, hold their breath, and the reason that we do that is because it can be very gratifying to get huge amounts of stuff when you're sectioning, and it can be so gratifying that you lose track of time. If you're holding your breath, it will remind you that the patient also can't breathe during this, and so um, that's why most nurses do that. But we should limit our pass to 10 seconds because, remember, the patient cannot breathe when you're sectioning them. When you're done with your 10-second pass, then, again, you're going to oxygenate the patient or hyperoxygenate them. Um, depending on you might use an ambu bag if they can't take deep breaths otherwise we turn their oxygen up this is um, a picture of wall suction i want i don't know if you can see but we have um usually we have a choice between intermittent or continuous suction and when you're suctioning a patient and i say intermittently suction that means manually you don't want to set your um, suction to intermittent. What that is for is we use the same suction no matter what we're doing. And so sometimes when we put an NG tube down and we're suctioning out somebody's stomach or relieving distension or, or whatever, then we want it on intermittent because we don't want it to attach to the wall of the stomach and just stay suction there like a, a vacuum sweeper would do if it um, got on a blanket. And so we use the intermittent suction for um, gastric suctioning. When we're doing respiratory sectioning, we want this set to continuous. And the way that we do it intermittently is we just um, use our thumb to release the section intermittently as we withdraw the catheter. In a lot of our long-term care or home health, you don't have the option of wall section. So this is what a bedside section looks like. Here's some pictures of some various types of equipment that you can use in sectioning. This is called a yonker section. This is kind of what dentists might use. This is hard, and so we would never go down somebody's throat or down their nose. It, it wouldn't fit. This is uh, often patients will use this on their own just to do oral sectioning of the mouth, or if you're um, cleaning the mouth of somebody who's unconscious, you use this to make sure that they don't aspirate any of the fluid that you use to clean their mouth. This is what would go down somebody's nose to do that type of suctioning. This is sometimes on somebody's trach, and these are nice because, as you can see, this little bag stays on and it acts kind of like an accordion, and so it keeps this sterile and you don't have to use new equipment every time, and it, it really makes it easier for the nurse to do suctioning with that. Suctioning seems to be something that's um, focused on a lot on NCLEX, and so as a result, I have a lot of examples of questions related to suctioning. So this one says, before suctioning a patient is important to, I called it hyperoxygenate, but here it's just oxygenate the patient, which is a key point to remember when suctioning a patient keeping the vent closed while inserting the catheter? Um, no, when you close the vent, that means it's going to apply suction. We don't want to apply suction when we're inserting the catheter, so that one's wrong. Apply suction continuously as the catheter is withdrawn, and that's what I was just talking about. We want to do it intermittent. However, we set the wall suction to continuous. Suction for no longer than 30 seconds. Um, 
try holding your breath for 30 seconds and see how well that goes. That's way too long. And so finally, because these are all wrong, we have to go with the last answer, which is use sterile procedure. Suctioning is limited to 10 seconds because prolonged suctioning may lead to which of the following? Hypoxia, which is um, low oxygen, hypertension, high blood pressure, increased intracranial pressure, or bradycardia. And what we're worried about is they are not getting any oxygen while they're being suctioned. During nasotracheal suctioning, so that means going down the nose, the nurse interprets that the client is adequately tolerating the procedure if with which observation is made. This one's a little bit tricky. Skin becomes cyanotic. Well, if they're turning blue, they are not tolerating the procedure well. Secretions are bloody. Again, um, if their secretions become bloody, you've caused some trauma, and that's another sign that they are not tolerating the procedure well at all. Coughing occurs. Well, yeah, when you touch somebody's gag reflex, of course it's going to cause some coughing. And then this last one, heart rate decreases and they become bradycardic. That is um, not a good sign. That shows that we're building up to maybe some increased intracranial pressure or something, and so we don't want to see that. So in this case, the proper answer is coughing occurs with the suctioning. During tracheotomy suctioning, so this is going through a trach, which action by the nursing student is incorrect, causing the clinical instructor to intervene? So we're looking for the bad one. Student uses wall suction unit pressure of 100. That's about right. I didn't mention that previously, but 100, and again, set it to continuous and not intermittent is correct. The student suctions the client trach tube for 15 seconds. Ugh, that's a little bit long. We said limit it to 10 seconds, right? So I'm already thinking this one. Student places the client in semi Fowler's position. That's correct. And the student inserts the catheter into the trach eostomy without applying suction, that is correct too. So we go back to the 15 seconds was too long. Which is the amount of time for application of suction during withdrawal of the catheter? Well, you should know that one by now. We said 15 seconds is too long. We need to limit it to 10. This was a sample question from your study guide. We're briefly going to talk about humidification and aerosol therapy. Um, when I think of a humidifier, I picture when I was a child and my mom would use something kind of like this in my room at night when I was sick, and this is a type of humidification. Room humidifiers deliver water vapor directly into the air. Um, it's important that if we're using these in a client's room, and mostly we, we won't use these in the hospital. This is something that people will use home health wise, but make sure that the water reservoir is um, clean because it can provide a medium for bacterial growth. What you're going to see more in the hospital when you do humidification is this little device here, which we attach to the oxygen, and the oxygen bubbles through this water, and it adds some humidity to their O2. Anytime you have a patient that's on more than two liters of oxygen, nasal cannula, probably needs to have humidity. It is a doctor's order, but we can request that from the doctor when we um, have a patient on more than two liters. They will, they're Nasal mucous membranes will really become dried out if they're on more than two liters of oxygen and they don't have humidity. So what it does, it um, prevents secretions from becoming thick and dry and um, helps keep this mucosa moist, which makes it um, less susceptible. If it's moist, it will be less susceptible to bacterial infection. Aerosol therapy is what we use to deliver nebulizing treatments. And again, a lot of times it's the um, respiratory therapist that does this. But if you work in long-term care, nursing does a lot of these um, nebulizing treatments, which I'm sure you've seen in clinical some. Aerosol therapy is primarily used to deliver medications. The patient should be instructed to sit upright if possible, slowly inhale, um, hold the breath briefly and then exhale slowly. So it's similar to using a meter dose inhaler. Whenever we give medications, and we'll talk more about this in farm, whenever we give medications through this route, it's important that we add the proper assessment to it. So we should be listening to lungs, monitoring respiratory rate before, then we administer the um, nebulizing treatment and we stay with the patient and then we check the lung sounds afterwards. Nurses are notoriously bad about doing this. So when I did clinical in Kingfisher, I always had an, um, one of my nursing students follow the respiratory therapist there so that they could see how this is supposed to be done. In real life, what happens is you have someone who needs a nebulizing treatment and as soon as you start it, the, the patient next door starts hollering and you're afraid they're going to fall out of bed and so you run next door and so 
nurses are really bad about monitoring this like we should. If you're in a facility that has wall O2, make sure you use the right.